Good evening. Welcome back to SF Commons. Tonight, we are talking about the political persecution of Julian Assange for the last eight years. We join the people of the world who believe in truth, transparency, and justice in asking the governments of the United Kingdom, the United States, Australia, Sweden, and Ecuador to let Julian Assange go in peace to live his life with his family without the threat of harassment, persecution, or destruction of his person. Quite simply, Julian Assange did not commit a crime. He did not do anything wrong. As a publisher of WikiLeaks, his publication exposed through the submissions of whistleblowers all over the world, the abuse of the most powerful wealthy people all over the world, the crimes committed by them, the violation of environmental laws that pose great risk to the environment and to human life, the war crimes in violation of the Geneva Convention, and corruption that hurts citizens they are supposed to represent. Anyway, welcome to the State Department. I think we have some interns in the back. Welcome. Uh, good to see you in this uh, exercise and transparency and democracy. <laughs> a decade ago, we knew a lot less about the world's powerful leaders and institutions. We knew only what they wanted us to know. Don't worry, be happy. 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 We didn't know how casually they broke the law or stitched up trade deals, how routinely they conducted mass surveillance or kidnapped, indefinitely detained, tortured, or even murdered people. But then... The whistleblowing website WikiLeaks... WikiLeaks is getting ready for a bombshell. WikiLeaks? Julian Assange... The guy ought to be... And I'm not for the death penalty, so if I'm not for the death penalty, I only want to do it. Illegally shoot the son of a... WikiLeaks. 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 I think the man is a high-tech terrorist. Julian Assange founded WikiLeaks, a media organization unlike any other. In one decade, WikiLeaks has published more secret documents than all the rest of the world's media combined. In 2007, WikiLeaks showed us inside Guantanamo Bay by publishing the manuals and standard operating procedures used to hide prisoners from the Red Cross, as well as PR guides used to eliminate certain words like suicide or to rename a hunger strike as voluntary fasting. 500,000 documents make up the Iraq and Afghanistan war logs, the most detailed description of war to have ever been published. Each attack and death is listed, including 15,000 kills that had been kept secret from the public. When European oil company Trafigura dumped illegal toxic chemicals in the Ivory Coast, it convinced a British court to gag the BBC and The Guardian. WikiLeaks published the gag documents breaking the censorship ban. In 2010, WikiLeaks revealed how a U.S. Apache helicopter killed 18 people, including two journalists and people in a van driving children to school. What shocked the world was the video game commentary of soldiers eager to kill. Yeah, look at that, right through the windshield. <laughs> oh yeah, look at those dead bastards. Nice. The children from the van were severely injured in the attack. Their father and the other adults in the van were killed. The United States strongly condemns the illegal disclosure of classified information. Later that year, WikiLeaks released over 250,000 secret U.S. diplomatic cables about every country in the world. Cablegate exposed wrongdoing on every continent. WikiLeaks exposed the largest international agreements that the world has ever seen. 
the three big T's, which are being negotiated in secret. The three big T's are big business's new strategy to bypass the World Trade Organization and ensure that they get to set the international rules of what other countries can and cannot do. Today, WikiLeaks begins its release of emails documenting the private lives and private lies of private spies. WikiLeaks revealed the inner workings of private intelligence company Stratfor that provides advice to US government agencies, arms companies and Dow Chemical, who hired Stratfor to spy on the victims of the largest chemical disaster in history caused by their plant in Bhopal, India. With the 2.3 million emails published in the Syria files, including the emails of its head of state Bashar al-Assad, WikiLeaks revealed the true nature of the Syrian elite and President Berlusconi of Italy. Finally, coming in at number 10 are the emails of the US Democratic National Committee, which showed how the DNC undemocratically and illicitly stacked the deck against Bernie Sanders. As a result of those leaks, the DNC's five top heads rolled. Secretary Powell presented evidence last week that Baghdad has failed to disarm its weapons of mass destruction, willfully attempting to evade and deceive the international community. Our particular concern is that Saddam Hussein may supply terrorists with biological, chemical, or radiological material. Well, former CIA analyst Ray McGovern joining me now in studio to talk more about where the country stands today and why we invaded in the first place. Ray, I want to start. Here's some of the Iraq totals. Nearly 200,000 direct war deaths, 4,500 U.S. troops killed, millions of refugees, as Alexi just showed us, and trillions of dollars spent. This is the cost of the invasion. Where does the country stand today, and what's the impact that we see 13 years later? Well, there's still great controversy as to uh, why we went into Iraq. And the uh, conventional wisdom is this was just a terrible mistake by intelligence. You're talking about this argument of weapons of mass destruction Correct. and the intelligence given that there was something and then never ending up turning yeah. up. Yeah, the case was made by Cheney and the president and Powell and Rumsfeld. We former intelligence analysts knew that. And we warned the president with three memoranda before the war, don't listen to this. this how come there are so many refugees? You know, why are they? Why are they? Well, it also goes back, it also goes back to uh, the war in Iraq and the fact that we pretty much destroyed that country and Syria and now Libya. And, you know, it's, it's really uh, uh, people need to be held ac accountable for this. The point about WikiLeaks is, of course, that it's... Uh, represents the best of democracy in the sense that it's about truth, transparency and justice. And in any democratic society, uh, including the United States, of course, uh, they are the underpinnings of democracy. Um, and uh, you need organisations like WikiLeaks. Uh, you need these organisations to ensure that governments are held accountable. Uh, WikiLeaks has held governments accountable, not just in the United States, but across uh, Europe. Uh, Australia, uh, and it's important that these organisations not be seen as criminal organisations. They're not. They are an essential part and an essential tool of a democratic society. If WikiLeaks did not publish those documents, the war could still be going on, right? I, I think you make a very good point. People need to remember that the reason that the United States has been hunting down Julian Assange uh, is not because of the work that WikiLeaks did prior to 2010. It's the work that WikiLeaks did in 2010, which was to expose uh, what was happening in Iraq and what was happening in Afghanistan. And we know 
from particularly the Vietnam War that the US military and the US government and its allies will never uh, in a thousand years reveal the truth of what is happening in those conflicts unless they are forced to reveal that truth or they are forced to be accountable for that truth uh, courtesy of publishers uh, such as WikiLeaks. Now, in the case of WikiLeaks, uh, what it did was to lift the lid on the rhetoric behind the Iraq war and the Afghanistan war. In other words, to show that both those wars were in effect uh, simply uh, uh, regime change, uh, none too subtle regime change, gone well beyond the false mandate that they had at the start. And secondly, uh, that what they'd done is killed you know, literally hundreds of thousands of innocent people and committed serious war crimes. Now, these are things that uh, every person in a democracy or in any country in the world should know about. Uh, and to seek to prosecute a person uh, or an organisation simply because they have revealed what is an appalling, appalling abuse of power uh, is quite frightening. Had it not been for Chelsea Manning and, and WikiLeaks exposing these war crimes, the world would have never found out. Look how what happened to Vietnam, how many millions were killed. Uh, if, uh, firstly, the First Amendment is quite clear in the United States. It protects uh, organizations like WikiLeaks, which is a publisher. It is in no different position to the New York Times and Washington Post, any other uh, broadcaster or publisher in the United States. There's a, authorities have not prosecuted the publishers of the New York Times, uh, etc. Uh, and that is because they know that there is a First Amendment defense. WikiLeaks is in no different position. Chelsea Manning uh, is uh, like Daniel Ellsberg in relation to the Pentagon Papers. These people are heroes. They're heroes, and I use that word very advisedly. They're heroes because what they do is they lift the lid on the lies uh, and they show that the American people and its ally and the, the, the people of its allies, including Australia, mind you, uh, have been lied to by their government. And uh, there's no greater sin on the part of a government in a democratic society than to lie continually to its people, particularly when it's putting the lives of young, particularly young uh, Americans or young Australians on the line uh, for a war. Uh, and so when it comes to WikiLeaks, there's no doubt that there is a First Amendment defence available. Uh, there's no doubt also that there's, uh, within the Department of Justice in the United States, there would be varying views about whether or not WikiLeaks could be prosecuted as opposed to should be prosecuted. Uh, but, you know, the important point to remember is that WikiLeaks, if WikiLeaks is prosecuted, what that, the message that sends whistleblowers around the world is that Governments are not interested in the truth. Governments will pursue you if you present the truth. I might just mention there's a, currently a case in Australia um, of a, a lawyer called Bernard Caleri and a witness uh, called Witness K, who is a person who is Mr Caleri's client. What Mr Caleri did as a lawyer uh, and his client, it's alleged that they revealed that Australia had been spying uh, on East Timor, an impoverished nation near Australia, uh, about 10 to 15 years ago. They revealed that that was happening. Uh, Mr. Caleri and Witness K have now been prosecuted under Australian law for revealing this secret. And again, this is a chilling of freedom of speech. It's a chilling, it leads to a chilling of uh, the truth emerging, and it's a very disturbing trend. And the Ecuadorian embassy, and sought asylum. Could you talk about the premise of this whole asylum? Look, uh, what he did was to seek asylum. In Sweden, you can arrest people just for the purposes of questioning. You don't have to charge them just for the purposes of questioning. Uh, there were no charges. Uh, there were never any charges on the table. It was purely for questioning in relation to the particular matter. But the, 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 the real issue was that if he'd gone back to Sweden, Sweden has a poor track record in recent years in handing people over to the Americans uh, when it comes to uh, extradition requests. And so uh, he rightly uh, took the view that if he was handed over to the United States, he could face torture 
or what's called cruel and unusual punishment under the law, which is, of course, what happened to Chelsea Manning. Chelsea Manning was uh, deprived of sleep, uh, subjected to all sorts of uh, torture by the US military. Um, these are all breaches. Of... There have been a number of statements by US politicians that, that they want Julian Assange killed, or alternatively, they want him in jail for the rest of his life. And in, in fact, there were recent statements by uh, a congressman in the United States uh, to, those of, to, to that effect. Uh, and so there's no doubt that if he went to the United States, uh, he would be subjected to the sort of torture that Chelsea Manning was subjected to. Now, on that basis, a person is perfectly entitled as a matter of international law to seek asylum, to prevent torture. Uh, no person can be handed over to another country for the purposes of torture, uh, or what's called cruel and unusual punishment, which mm -hmm. is like torture. Now, uh, it is perfectly acceptable to do what Julian did, which was to seek asylum. Julian Assange has been there since 2012. And in 2012, that's when uh, he battled uh, in the UK courts to try and get the Swedish arrest warrant set aside. Now, he was unsuccessful. Uh, mind you, uh, having said he was unsuccessful, he was right to challenge it because there are a number of people in the United Kingdom who think these types of arrest warrants by the Swedes should not be part of the English law because uh, they don't go to the question of whether a person should be charged. They're merely arresting a person simply so he can, that person can be questioned. Uh, so since 2012, he has been in the Ecuadorian embassy. And I think it's important to understand the context of the Ecuadorian embassy. It is a relatively small space with very little natural light. Uh, it has no outdoor access, such as a courtyard. Uh, and so he's in worse conditions than uh, a prisoner who's in solitary confinement, who at least, at the very least, under international standards and the standards of most countries, gets at least one hour a day uh, in the sunlight. Uh, and so uh, his health uh, has deteriorated markedly. Uh, his physical health, his mental health is remarkably resilient. But if, he, if there's not an end brought to what's happening, uh, his health will be uh, in marked decline for the rest of his life, and it will be his life. Uh, if he steps out of the embassy, he would be arrested immediately. I've been to the embassy, and uh, there are soldiers, uh, not soldiers, there are uh, officers of the UK police there. The UK uh, police and security have spent millions of pounds on this operation. Uh, that's money that, of course, could be spent on hospitals, schools, and probably putting police where they're needed rather than outside the Ecuadorian embassy. But the UK have refused to abide by what are conventions and when it comes to asylum. And what I mean by that is, for example, if a person needs medical help, uh, most countries will say, look, uh, we'll allow you to take that person to the hospital uh, under police escort, and then they can come back, uh, which is what happens with prisoners all the time. Uh, they have not allowed Julian Assange to do that. So he has not been able to go to a hospital, not been able to go to a doctor, not been able to go to a dentist and get the sort of basic medical care that most of us expect because the United Kingdom has said if he steps outside, uh, then uh, they will arrest him. And, you know, again, that's appalling and it doesn't happen to any prisoner uh, around the world. All prisoners are entitled to go to, to get escorts uh, to and from hospital. OK, they would arrest him on what ground? He would be arrested on the basis that he's breached his bail. So what happened was that with the arrest warrant, uh, he was bailed to appear uh, at a London court. Uh, he failed to attend bail because, of course, uh, he sought asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy and uh, therefore uh, he would now be dealt with for a breach of bail. But can I say a breach of bail under UK law is a relatively minor offence. It's usually dealt with by way of a fine or a very small time in prison when and we're talking about a matter of weeks or months. Uh, it's not a serious offence. And so that could be dealt with by the UK. That's the only matter which the UK is seeking him. Uh, the real issue in this particular case is the failure of the United States to declare its hand. It has refused to say whether or not it's got an indictment uh, in other words, it's filed uh, papers in a US court uh, seeking to charge or charging Julian Assange with an offence. And it's an intolerable situation that the United States justice system uh, and those prosecutors in the United States refuse to reveal uh, what's happening. They've refused to reveal it to uh, anyone who's asked them that question. Uh, they've simply said that they won't confirm or deny about the conduct of the prosecutors, if there are prosecutors in this case. I think the United States 
has failed completely to follow what's called procedural fairness, and that is to set out right. uh, if, if it wishes to arrest, on what basis do they seek to arrest, you know, using what statute, using exactly. what powers, and then the matter can be argued. But they have refused to do that, uh, despite some hints by congressmen uh, over the years uh, that they want to do that. There have been... Uh, there have been no papers filed to our knowledge. However, there has been uh, a secret grand jury process, uh, we're told, that's been going on for a number of years. But look, the, the bottom line is this, to cut to the chase, the United States simply needs to reveal its hand. It needs to do what any other country does. And that, that is to say, we either have no interest in speaking with Julian Assange, in which case he can walk out of the embassy and deal with the breach of bail matter, or alternatively, we do have an interest in Julian Assange and we have an interest on this particular basis. It just needs to come clean with its position. In, in, in 2012, President Obama, Congress passed the National Defense Authorization Act for the Department of Defense. The National Defense and Authorization Act affirms certain provisions that authorize indefinite military, military detention of civilians without habeas corpus and without due process. This extended the authorization for use of military force, the AUMF, which expanded the executive branch power. This conflicts with what the U.S. Constitution says. The Fourth Amendment in search and seizure of person properties or effects without probable cause, and the Sixth Amendment due process. They will be deprived of their life, liberty, and property without due process. The fact that this statute was part of the federal government's expenditure and authorization conflict directly with what the Constitution says and subject him to this, or there will be a challenge in court, and then the challenge in court would be that the U.S. government is violating the Constitution. But then the U.S. government will say that they can violate those constitutional provisions if they have a compelling government interest, strict scrutiny. And the compelling government interest, typically, normally, would be national security. I think is that in a civilized society and in a society that subscribes to the rule of law, those processes would not exist. And to use national security as a way of undermining a person's rights and to keep detaining them uh, is unconscionable. And right. uh, unfortunately, one of the one of the major features of the war, so-called war on terror has been the way countries like the United States and Australia and the UK have used the blanket term national security in right. order to undermine the rights of individuals such as Julian Assange and to arrest a person and keep them under lock and key and detain them for a number of years so you have these legal arguments is grossly unfair. I think it's very dubious. I'm not an expert in Ecuadorian law, but uh, I think once you have a person who uh, you've granted asylum, uh, it would certainly be a breach of international uh, refugee law and international migration law generally and international law with respect to asylum right. uh, to then effectively revoke that asylum and hand that person over. It would be certainly a breach of international law. I would have thought it would also be challenged in the Ecuadorian courts. There's a principle called reform, non-reformment. In other words, you cannot send a person back to a country that they came from uh, if they have, if there is a chance uh, that they will be subjected to persecution. That would include uh, unlawful prosecution. It would include uh, being punished in a way that's very severe, including cruelty and uh, unusual punishments. Mm -hmm. uh, and the question is whether or not that applies in this particular case. But I think as a matter of law, uh, once you grant a person asylum on the basis that they fear uh, that they will be, they've got a legitimate fear that they will be persecuted in a third country, right. you certainly breach of that principle to then uh, withdraw that uh, claim of asylum 
unless yeah. you've got good reason to, in other words, that they fake their papers or they're not the exactly. person they say that. None of, none of those apply in the case of Julian Assange. The current Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull and the current Foreign Minister Julie Bishop are not hostile to Julian Assange, and we've had some discussions in Australia seeking to get the Australian government involved in this matter. Mm -hmm. Australia is a very close ally of the United Kingdom and of the United States, and uh, one of the ways in which it could assist would be for Julian Assange to be allowed to come back to Australia. Uh, therefore, uh, he wouldn't be sent to the United States. The United Kingdom would solve a problem, and also Ecuador would solve a problem. And so uh, that's a matter that we've taken up with the Australian government, and certainly the Australian government rather pointedly, has refused to join in the aggressive language. Treaty. The United States and the UK has an extradition treaty. Australia has an extradition treaty with the United States. The fundamental principle of extradition is this, though. A court will only hand over a person to another country if there is a like charge on its own statute books. In other words, for example, if a person commits fraud in the United States and they flee to the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom will probably hand them back because the, the statute, because there is a crime of fraud in the United Kingdom. Right. It's much more conjectural in the case of Julian Assange. I don't know what possible charge the United States, United Kingdom and the courts in Australia uh, would take a very good look at ext any extradition request. What other legal avenues are there considering the fact that there are no real charges yeah, there needs to be there needs to be a resolution of this matter. It's gone on for eight years. The United States has not played fair. In fact, the United States' conduct in this matter has been appalling. Exactly. Uh, Australia, the United Kingdom, and Ecuador need to get a resolution to this matter. It needs to be protected from the United States, and uh, the matter needs to be brought to a conclusion. Julian Assange has committed no crime. Exactly. Those who did commit crimes in in Iraq and Afghanistan have not been prosecuted, and I think that, that that's the real injustice in this case. Well, look, I think that we've, we've, we've really explored in this interview all of the legal issues that are involved. Uh, so uh, I don't think there are any other legal issues. There are certainly no charges in Australia and there's no suggestion that he's done anything wrong in Australian law. There are no charges in Ecuador. There are no charges in the United Kingdom other than a breach of bail, right. which is a relatively minor matter. Uh, and, uh, you know, the bottom line is that he is a publisher. Uh, like any other publisher, exactly. uh, he makes documents uncomfortable, and that's never a crime. The point is that publishers like the New York Times and others ought to be rallying to the support of Julian Assange because uh, they could be next on the list. Great. And does he know that there are people worldwide who are you know, him and... Big names in the world of whistleblowing gathered today outside of the DOJ. And Wright, Jesslyn Radak, and Ray McGovern all spoke in defense of WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. The gathering was prompted by hostile comments made about WikiLeaks by members of the Trump administration in actively hacking the DNC last fall, citing former President Obama's own words that the evidence was inconclusive. What do we know from recent WikiLeaks revelations? And this is really embarrassing to the CIA. We had a rally in front of um, the White House in Washington, D.C. to support Julian Assange, to send a message to... President Donald Trump, that we want him free, or we just, many of us stood together and in support of Julian Assange, who is under threat of being evicted from the Ecuador embassy in London. He has been there over six, hasn't seen his children in eight years. He is gagged, meaning he has no internet, no visitors and no access to phones. So he's literally in solitary confinement for the last four months which under the Nelson Mandela Act by the UN is um, torture, so WikiLeaks, which is literally WikiLeaks. And then after the election in April, when Jeff Sessions said he was going to make it a priority to arrest Julian, Trump went ahead and said, go ahead and arrest him. We are here protesting that and stating that Julian Assange should be free, not just because he's a person or because of his human rights, but because of free press, free speech, and the First Amendment, which covers that, and this is a violation of our First Amendment rights. If they arrest Assange, he will be five years terms for espionage, and it will set a precedent for all future journalists and anyone who speaks out against the government to be arrested. This is wrong. This is against our constitutional rights, and we need to stand up for him. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time.
Good night.